In part one of this episode of Greycast, LML, Quinn, and I discuss the origin of Valerians and the significance of waking the dragon. So if you missed that, I will link it in this video. In part two, we will discuss the Valerians, Blood and Fire, the Doom, Dragons, Valerian Steel, Dragon Horns, and Glass Candles. I will link off the links to their channel so you can check them out, but we're just going to pick up right where we left off in part one. So now that we know the origin of where we think the Valerians come from and Daenerys' ancestors, we want to talk about Valeria a little bit. It was on the Great Peninsula, across from Slaver's Bay, that those who brought an end to the empire of Old Gis, though not to all of their ways originated, sheltered there amidst the great volcanic mountains known as the Fourteen Flames who learned to tame dragons and make them the most fearsome weapon of war that the world ever saw. The tales the Valyrians told of themselves claimed that they were descended from the dragons and were kin to the ones they now controlled. In such fragments of Barth's unnatural history as remain, the Septon appears to have considered various legends examining the origins of dragons and how they came to be controlled by the Valyrians. The Valyrians themselves claimed that dragons sprang forth as the children of the Fourteen Flames. While in Karth, the tales state that there was once a second moon in the sky. One day this moon was scalded by the sun and cracked like an egg, and a million dragons poured forth. In Ashai, the tales are many and confused, but certain texts, all impossibly ancient, claim that the dragons first came from the shadow, a place where all of our learning fails us. These Ashai E histories say that people so ancient they had no name first tamed the dragons in the shadow and brought them to Valyria, teaching the Valyrians their arts before departing from the annals. Yet, if men in the shadow had tamed dragons first, why did they not conquer as the Valyrians did? It seems likelier that the Valyrian tale is the truest, but there were dragons in Westeros once. Valyrians came. As our own legends and histories tell, if dragons did spring first from the Fourteen Flames, they must have been spread across much of the known world before they were tamed. In fact, there is evidence for this, as dragon bones have been found as far north as Ib, and even in the jungles of Sathorius. But the Valyrians harnessed and subjugated them, as no one else could. God, so you read so well, I love it. I love that voice. Quinn we, uh, reads great, and he uh, that is just uh, packed with information, man. It yeah. is indeed. That was a perfect quote to open up Valyria. So we get several different ideas about where dragons came from, right? And we've talked about some of these already in the podcast. Well, we've talked about all of them, haven't we? The moon <laughs> cracking, the shadows, the Valyrian 14 flames. But yeah, the Valyrian idea... The idea that the Valyrians spread out to the world was that they found the first dragons in the 14 flames and that's where they came from. But how true is that? Not very. I don't Not think yet. Well. I would say that uh, the last clues about dragons having, you know, dragon bones having been found everywhere tells us that before mankind, probably back in the age of, you know, giants and children of the forest and unicorns and the great lions of the West. You know, dragons probably roamed all over the world and they probably made their homes in volcanoes. Uh, if they had their pick, you know, they'll pick places like Dragonstone and Valyria and Shy. Which so, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Funny, you should say something about that. Uh, in any case, but yeah, you get the point. So um, it's very possible that the Valerians did discover dragons at the 14 Flames, um, but the knowledge in order to tame them came from a shy, I think. And mm -hmm. the Valerians themselves, I think, came from a shy. You could, con like the Amethyst Empress, okay? She's got purple eyes and she's got Valerian hair. I would say that probably represents like a dynasty or a clan. Like when we're talking about these gemstone emperors, there's, they give us links of time that they ruled for and they're hundreds of years. Yeah. And so it's more likely that the Tourmaline clan or house Tourmaline, you might say, ruled for 800 years or however. That's, I mean, that makes a lot more sense. So the Amethyst Empress is probably representative of a 
one of the peoples of the Great Empire of the Dawn that happens to look just like Valerians. So probably the Valerians are simply descendants of the Amethyst Empress people, her relatives. Yeah, Isn't it so said somewhere that the Yellow Emperor kept a dragon in his court? Indeed, um, and I have to wonder what sort of memory he's chasing there. Mm -hmm. hmm. And if you think about it, of course, the real world culture that uses dragons the most is Chinese culture. And Yi Ti is, you know, it's the China. equivalent yeah. of China. And so the Great Empire of the Dawn is essentially the ancestors of the Yi Tish and the Ashai and a few others. It seems like they were probably a multi-ethnic empire because they were so big. Like they they encompass the area of the Jogos Nai and the Nefer and the Hercoon and uh you know the Yit Yitish and Lang. Those these places were all inside the realm of the Great Empire of the Dawn. So anything that big, it's like the Roman Empire. That's a multi ethnic empire. You're ruling over different people that live in native areas. So So they're like so the the Amethyst Empress had her own tribe of people. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's my guess. And I mean, it's just like the most logical way to interpret it. And, you know, because what's the point of showing us one of these gemstone emperors, coincidentally, the last one to rule before the bloodstone emperor that looks like a Valerian? Like they all right. have a Valerian hair, but she's the only one with purple eyes. So you have to think like when the bloodstone emperor took power and overthrew the Amethyst Empress, well, what happened to her other clan? her family and kin and the amethyst empress loyalists as i like to say well they maybe they escaped and fled uh, to starfall and valeria that's essentially what i think and the little bit of valerian looks that we see in house dane that dates back like from before the long night because they're first men house that's how that's explained uh, because you know these fucking dragon lords from ashai have to have come to westeros because how else does the Azor High and Lightbringer shit matter to Westeros? Yeah. Like, there's, it has to intersect somehow. Oh, well, they definitely came to Westeros. It's proof yeah. that they came to Westeros with the few... George stuff. R. R. Martin, 100% confirmed in a fan correspondence from, like, 1999 that there were definitely dragons all over the place once, right? Okay, but now, Gray, what were you saying? With the stone, the black stone? Yes. That that can only be made by dragons, right? That's right. At the base of the high tower in Old Town, made out of fused stone, which can only be made by dragon lords. And the uh, the high towers built towers, successive towers on top of that thing. And the high towers are first men, perhaps the first people to come to that area of Old Town. Mm -hmm. And there's already this fused stone fortress. So that's one of the big clues, really. It, it tells you that dragon lords came to Westeros and built a fortress before the long night and we know valeria up, uh, rose after the long night so that's a really big clue that dragon lords existed before valeria and that they came to westeros and that's kind of why all of this stuff matters is because there's some ancient connection to the long i mean why else is it that we have these others in westeros that need a flaming sword a zora high reborn type to come fight them and a zora high is from a shy Right. There's got to be a reason it, it connects, right? Yeah. And that's why the theory matters. The theory definitely matters. <laughs> so I want to talk about Valeria before the doom. Okay. Because, because a lot of people that I, that I talk to, I talk to a lot of people every day um, online and stuff. And the common belief is that the Targaryens were like royalty in, in Valeria. And I don't think that was the case. They were just minor house. They were a minor yeah, house. Yeah, they were a minor house. And they would have made themselves outcast, essentially, by taking all of their things and moving to Bumfuck, which was yeah. Dragonstone. We hear about the Valyrians taking over the continent of Essos. And then we hear about these dragon roads, these like things that they're just like... Uh, the demon roads. Way advanced. <laughs> like they're, they're, It's like an advanced technology. So is the reason that they say that these arts of Valyria or magics of Valyria were lost is because all the dragons had died? They don't know how to do it anymore. The knowledge just kind of faded from history. I mean, it could have something to do with 
the magic just simply not working anymore, perhaps? Because we know a lot of magic got weaker after the last dragon died. And we can only assume that uh, dragons existing in Valyria um, did some that made magic more potent in the world in general because it said that after the doom that magic died in the west it faded well, away I, I think it's strongly implied that the 14 flames are themselves a source of magic and probably a hinge of the world and so if you've got dragons living there as mm -hmm. well then you know, there's a lot of things amplifying magic but i think it would help to list the gray is touching on the the lost technology of the valerians and this is a really interesting thing uh the targaryens did not bring a lot of Valyrian technology with them after the Doom. So the major Valyrian technology that we know is making fused stone, which we've talked about. They made roads with it. They made fortresses with it. They made the walls of Volantis with it. Made a lot of stuff. They made Dragonstone, etc. Um, second, Valyrian steel. They, they made mostly swords, but apparently they made suits of armor. They made Aegon's crown. A uh, few other things they make out of Valyrian steel. That is a lost art. The Targaryens do not, they did not make Valyrian steel after the Doom. They did not make fused stone after the Doom. Uh, then we have Euron's Dragonbinder horn. He says that's from Valyria. And um, Danny also recalls tales of the Valyrians using, quote, sorcerous horns to control dragons. It's when she's flying on Drogon and she's like, well, Valerians of old used sorcerous horns, but all I have is this whip. So she knows about the horns, but we never hear about the Targaryens ever using a dragon horn. Yeah. Uh, then the last one is glass candles. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those Targaryens were using glass candles, but we've never heard about them using glass candles. So no. it's really fucking weird, to be honest. It's like the, <laughs> the Targaryens knew the doom was coming, according to the story, because of Danny's the Dreamer. And they took dragons with them, but they didn't bring glass candles. If they did, they hid them. Uh, they didn't bring the knowledge of making fused stone. They didn't bring the knowledge of making Valyrian steel. And they didn't bring any dragon binder horns. So what do you guys think about that? In my most recent video, it's, it's totally about this. But um, maybe, see, the thing is, Valyrian magic is rooted in fire. It's also rooted in blood. I think contributor to the blood side of this whole thing was probably slaves, right? So the Targaryens are on the continent Westeros, where slavery has been outlawed since the rise of the Faith of the Seven. So we're talking for like thousands of years. So I feel like that could have been one factor, right? Okay, uh, maybe they just slaves. I mean, because if, if 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 the other people of Westeros were like, there are these weird Targaryens that are like enslaving people on Dragonstone. I feel like kind of maybe they would have tried to do something because they had they did have Balaria on the Black Dread. But he wasn't really Balery on the Black Dread at that point. He was a much younger, much smaller dragon, so he wouldn't have been the threat. I feel like the younger Balery on the Black Dread could have been killed, so maybe those Targaryens then didn't want to risk it. They didn't want to risk like using slaves just to do this magic. And, so, and, and yeah, I think a lot of it required blood. So if they didn't have the blood, they couldn't, couldn't do the magic, so maybe it just kind of slipped from their knowledge. Yeah, That's one theory, the and then the other... Sorry, Quinn, let me yeah. back up your point real quick. You're, you're sort of summarizing, but I think it's good to tell people, like, the reason why we believe that blood magic is necessary to make, say, Valyrian steel is because it's strongly implied in the world of ice and fire that that's the case. Um, the Kohor is, they know how to rework Valyrian steel, and they've been trying to discover the secrets of it, and they've been sacrificing children and humans in order to try to recreate it. So they believe that it's human sacrifice that is the missing element. And then there's a lot of clues that Lightbringer is the template for Valerian Steel, where you have to use a human being. You know, like, how many babies does it take to make a Valerian Steel sword, I guess, is the question. Yeah. So <laughs> what you're pointing out is really, really smart, that, you know, they wouldn't have had a source of people to sacrifice, and maybe so they chose to gave it up in order to integrate themselves, right? Mm-hmm. I, I feel like the Targaryens themselves that knew about the uh, the rest, I guess you'd say the recipe for Valyrian magic was fire and blood. And I believe that's why they might have took those house words, fire mm -hmm. and blood. It could have been the sacrifice part that is the reason why they didn't, they didn't do it. Because if you think about all the slaves, like Quinn, you said the slaves might mm -hmm. have had a part to play. And okay. then, and then LML says, well, the 14 flames could have been a source of magic 
itself. So if you think about all the slaves that were dying inside of the 14 flames while mining, like they were dying every day. That could have been a fire and blood magic source, the 14 flames itself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that does actually make a lot of sense. Like on a raw level, we're just feeding the, you're feeding blood into the fire of the flames. Yeah, that's interesting. We Okay, so we know that the Targaryens knew that the doom would happen, and then it happened 12 years later. But what if they didn't just know that it was going to happen, but they understood why? And what if the why had something to do with the, just the Valyrians' really evil ways of sacrificing people? And what if that yes. magic is just intrinsically volatile and just dangerous? And so the Targaryens made a conscious decision to leave it behind. Yeah, that makes sense. And the magic could have also had a chain reaction on other worldly things. Sure, like, yeah. Like, I definitely feel like the the others, I know we see this, Children of the Forest make the others and all of that thing, but I feel like they're the counterbalance to the Valyrians. And the more magic the Valyrians use, the more, for lack of a better, better word, the more the globe warms and Global the more warm. dragons there are, the globe warms, like the, the atmosphere becomes a hotter environment and it throws off the balance. Well, and so what you're referring to is a folk tale. People of Westeros say that after the dragons died out, the summers became shorter. Yes. So there's maybe a link there. Yes. And like the dragons were gone. The dragons were gone. And then the others are just, they're rising. Like we see them in the prologue. They're back. They're taking, they're taking blood sacrifices basically. Well, I don't know what they're doing. They're taking kids. They're taking babies. Sure. Yeah, no, it's and, parallel. And then Daenerys' dragons are born as they're congregating in the north. So it, it feels like that they are balancing out each other. Yeah. Well, definitely. in order to write a book, it's kind of all got to happen at the same time, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like in a way the dragons are perhaps late, right? Because, like, the others have been, like, up and working for at least a few decades, right? Because we know that yeah. they've been taking crafts as children and stuff like that. And it seems, if you if you look at just Targaryen history in Westeros, there, there's there been at least an, there's been at least one other event where someone has tried to hatch dragons and it's gone, like, horribly wrong. And that's, like, that's Aegon V, right? Some he, of them, yeah. he suddenly, out of nowhere, in, like, the last seven years of his rule or something, became obsessed with dragons out of nowhere. I've got to hatch dragons, got to do this, got to find out everything that I possibly can about dragons. I don't think it's so far-fetched to say that a similar force, or perhaps even the same force that was pushing Daenerys to hatch dragons, was attempting to push Aegon to hatch dragons. Well, we know that um, the Woods Witch, or the Ghost of High Heart, I think, mm -hmm. had something to do with that as well. Wasn't she giving him, like, prophecies and stuff? She prophesied that the prince that was promised would be born of the line of uh, Ares and Rhaella. Yeah. And that they needed, that was before they were wed. So she was saying they need to marry each other and have children. And that ended up being Rhaegar. And yeah, so. And when they finally do this, trying to hatch these eggs, it's on Rhaegar, at Rhaegar's birth. Yep. And I, I've been like back and forth with it. I know that he commissioned journeys to Ashai to, to find dragon lore. And we know of blood sacrifice. Like, do you think they were trying to do old Valyrian magic there? The blood sacrifice? It was some sort of attempt. Yeah. Do you think they could have possibly been trying to sacrifice Rhaegar himself? I don't know if if that's the case, but I, I obviously they were trying to do some ritual that went horribly wrong. Right, because uh, they two kings died there, and that's the whole you know wake the two kings to wake the dragon. Because mm -hmm. it was uh, Egg died, and Egg's son died. Ares uh, was Egg's grandson. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Sir Duncan the Tall was there. He died. Jenny of Old Stone, which is. You know, I have my theories about her and the Ghost of High Heart as well. Yeah, like, were they, like, I feel like she was trying to force fulfill some kind of prophecy. Okay. Like, like a Melisandre. I, I, I kind of think that perhaps the Ghost of High Heart foresaw 
Summer Hall, but understood that it needed to happen and that she couldn't stop it, perhaps. Right? Because my my whole crazy idea, which the more I'm looking into it, kind of seems less and less crazy, is that the mm-hmm. Ghost of High Heart is actually the daughter of Leaf, who traveled the Westeros for a while before she went back up north. Mm-hmm. And that Jenny of Oldstone was actually her daughter, right? Yeah, because like when you when you get that chapter where Arya encounters the ghost of High Heart, like she when they give her when she gives them her visions, the Brotherhood, she always asks for a song. She's always asking for Jenny's song. This mm-hmm. is something that she is, even after all these years, just full of grief about. If this was just a friend of hers, it doesn't make a lot of sense that she'd still be crying about this all these years later. Exactly. But if this was her daughter that she knowingly allowed to go to her own death even then it all makes perfect sense she and we know that oh, just one more thing about jenny is that she lived in the woods she was like kind of a crazy woods woman because so if she had the blood of children of the forest it makes sense with flowers in her hair yes <laughs> but we know that the ghost of high heart does say that she gorged on grief like gorged on grief at yeah. summer hall but yeah, I that feel- sounds like deep personal connections to the people that died yeah and i feel like none of her visions are wrong no the ghost of high heart none of her visions have been wrong for something to go so wrong like that if this was something that she prophesized i feel like she did this on purpose or she was trying to force fulfill something like melisandre or at that time she hadn't mastered her craft well i mean yeah i mean i I certainly think that's possible i think i think that's possible but i do i do kind of get the impression that like maybe she did see summer hall but that it was kind of just like I really can't stop it. Maybe she understood that, like, I see this prophecy and it's gonna happen and it, and it can't be stopped in a way. It's kind of like, I know people fucking get mad when I talk about Dune a lot, but like, it's kind of like Paul Atreides in Dune, right? He sees the Jihad, he wants to stop it, but he understands that it's going to happen. And there's really nothing that he can not that he can do about it. So he kind of feels like this is guilt before it even happens, right? Because he understands mm-hmm. that he can't stop it. Yeah, well, I like that. I like, I especially like the connection between Jenny of Old Stones and the Ghost of High and the Ghost of High Heart, and Jenny of Old Stones being her actual daughter or some kind of relative. Mm-hmm. I, so, I really like that. Uh, Quinn, uh, yesterday in our podcast, remember how I was telling you that there's a lot of clues about Nissa Nissa being a child of the forest. Yes, and you were talking you know, about the elves. The, the Nissa I agree men. with it. I agree our with elves. it. Uh, in Scandinavian folklore. And uh, in any case, uh, Jenny of Old Stones and the Ghost of High Heart are both important Nissa Nissa parallels. They're like a before and after. And the Ghost of High Heart is also very comparable to Lady Stoneheart. They're similar characters of like a weirwood ghost goddess figure. Oh, I been- like that. I, yeah. I've never heard that comparison before. Well, so when you're done with Moons of Ice and Fire, if I <laughs> still have your attention, then do the Weirwood Compendium stuff that leads into the Weirwood Goddess. And I've got three episodes all about Weirwood Compendium. Missa. What? Because I'm in the Weirwood Compendium. Compendium. Well, so the ones you want are Weirwood Goddess one, two, and three, but those jump off of Weirwood Compendium four. Okay. So, like I always say, you know, read them in order if you can, because it makes a lot more damn sense if you do. <laughs> but yeah, I like I like those connections. I'm flattered, of course, that you find any of it interesting. So thanks. Oh yeah, I can't get enough of uh, a song of ice and fire, especially when it's not just uh, who's the Valencar. <laughs> <laughs> but who is the Valencar? No, I'm kidding. Quinn said something about I guess 15 minutes ago now that I wanted to circle <laughs> back to, which was we I asked the question of why didn't. The Valerians or the Targaryens take any of this good Valerian technology with them because all of it would have been useful. I mean, Valerian steel swords were prized. Uh, Valerian stone is so useful for building fortresses. Like, uh, Dragonstone was already built before the Doom, so they had that one fortress. But you know, they went and built King's Landing like a normal city, and they could have made it out of fused stone. So, uh, Quinn suggested that not only was it, uh, you know, politically necessary, you know, because all of it is fueled on blood sacrifice. They didn't have people to sacrifice. So this is a great theory, I think. Uh, and it also presents the Targaryens as like the, the nicer version of dragon lords, even though half of them are crazy and evil and half of them are decent. Like 
they're the cleaned up version. Like the real dragon lords were like Nazis with dragons who enslaved whole assholes. races and depopulated and conducted freaky experiments and yeah. like fed people into the slave mines, like concentration camps. I mean, the real Valerians were awful. Yeah, they were. And uh, I th a lot of people think that's why the word Aryan, A-R-Y-A-N, like Aryan Nazis is in Valerian because they're very comparable to Nazis. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they were good people either, but I do feel like if like politically, if they wanted to, they could have forced their hand on the Valerian magic because politically it really was wasn't okay for Aegon to marry both of his sisters either, but he did do that. I right, could because be totally sure, wrong. surely they had a few prisoners of war in the dungeon they could have used to make a few swords or something, but they didn't make any swords. So I guess to bring it back to that theory, what I suspect is that they didn't have any of that technology and that Valerian society was segmented. And if you think about it, it was a freehold. They never had a single ruler. And one way to keep that in in uh, sort of balance of power running is if the various Dragonlord families had different specialties. And there's a quote that implies that very thing. And it's one of my favorite quotes. It's from A Storm of Swords. And it says, Sir, Sir Jorah shrugged. A dragon's natural span of days is many times as long as man's, or so the songs would have us believe. But the dragons the Seven Kingdoms knew best were those of House Targaryen. They were bred for war, and in war they died. It is no easy thing to slay a dragon, but it can be done. And of course, most of them died in dragon versus dragon fights, as we saw. But the thing is, look at that line. They were bred for war. Uh, so can you breed dragons for other purposes? And that <laughs> actually makes sense. It, because do you want Balerion the Black Dread to pave roads? No. No, because like to work with a road crew, a dragon <laughs> would have to be, I mean, don't think about it. Like if the Valerian roads are thousands of miles of straight road, you need your dragon like docile enough to work around a crew, but like steady and trained to just like make fucking roads. Like, more like a cow almost it's a completely different personality you would want yeah like horses like you have war horses and then you have plow horses exactly. and then you have yes. this is something i think we can uh infer about valerian culture is that they bred dragons for different reasons and the Val uh, and it says right here that house targaryen had war dragons so you probably wouldn't want just like we don't want our generals to have direct political power you might not have wanted the dragon lords with war dragons to also know how to make Valyrian steel and do everything else because then one of them might become an emperor and take power. So perhaps that's why they didn't have any of that other technology is because it was only House Targaryen that survived and all the magicians that knew how to make stone and Valyrian steel died in the doom. That makes sense. So we have good, good Valyrians and bad Valyrians. And we have dragons that are bred for war and dragons that are bred for making roads. And we have different factions in Valyria that do different things. I think so, yeah. All right. It's cool that you mentioned the Valyrians, good Valyrians, bad Valyrians. Of these, some argue that it was the curse of Garen the Great last coming to fruition. Others speak of the priest of R'hllor calling down the fire of their god in queer rituals. Some wedding the fanciful notion of Valyrian magic to the reality of the ambitious great houses of Valyria have argued that it was the constant whirl of conflict and deception amongst the great houses that may have led to the assassinations of too many of the reputed mages who renewed and maintained the rituals that banked the fires of the 14 flames. I, I thought it was in, I thought you would like the fire of their god part, LMO, where they're talking about perhaps the red priests call down the fire of their god and then it also says here that perhaps it was the great houses fighting amongst each other and deceiving each other and like assassinating too many of the wizards that were keeping the spells in check and that's what led to the carnage uh I yes I, I love I, that passage yeah, yeah. you're speaking my language you know <laughs> i i kind of have a conspiracy theory on valeria that involves the faceless men you can really it's really easy to see how the faceless men could set up the doom because think about what we know and this 
Think about what we know. Okay, so the Valerians built this complex civilization, not just near one volcano, but an entire mountain chain of volcanoes. We'll and the Valerian that. civilization existed for 5,000 years. So what does yeah. that tell you? They had a way to bottle up these volcanoes, right? Magic. Yeah. So they're maintaining an equilibrium of some kind, letting the volcanoes simmer, but not blow up. And not because the volcanoes, they blow up because they build up tension. The only way to prevent them from blowing up is to sort of steadily outlet the, you know, vent the gas or whatever so that it keeps today's at equilibrium and probably used magic to do that. But the point is, all you'd have to do was kill the sorcerers that are maintaining that equilibrium. And the whole thing would all that pent up energy that they've been keeping bottled up for thousands of years would basically explode at once. And that's what the doom looks like. So all the faceless men would have had to do is essentially a bunch of assassinations of key magicians, kind of all in one night, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would have inevitably blown up within hours. Yeah, I always go back to that story that the kindly man tells Arya mm -hmm. about um, mm -hmm. the first faceless men. And she's like, oh, well, why did you kill the slave? You mm -hmm. should have killed the masters. And he was like, well, the masters would get the gift soon or something. I can't remember the quote. I don't have it queued up, but it was yep. it, it was implied that they gave the masters the gift. It is. So if you like conspiracy theories, there is a lot of fodder for conspiracy theories here. So House Targaryen, okay, so uh, uh, yeah, uh, my 12 year old niece uh, had this dream and that's how we knew to move away from Valyria with all of our wealth and our dragons. <laughs> totally, yeah. I mean, think about that for a second. Like maybe they had something to do with selling out the rest of Valyria and coincidentally, they don't practice blood magic anymore or slavery, yep. which are just the things the faceless men hate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can then, your mind can draw connections there. Oh, yeah, and then and then they were minor house, and then suddenly they're the only dragon lords, pretty much. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, yeah, there's, suddenly they're yeah. the only people with dragons there. Yeah, so it kind of makes sense. Like you kill that guy, he's maintaining that part of the mountain. You kill him, and fuck all their shit up. <laughs> and that's how you do it. Uh, then there's the issue of gold. Um, the it says. It says that uh, the Lannisters paid like a gold enough to raise an entire army or something uh, to, to get Bright Roar, which they mm -hmm. would have bought from the Targaryens. The Targaryens were the ones uh, selling Valyrian swords, I would guess, to Westeros since they're they're manning the trading post or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they they could have taken that money and hired faceless men. Is is part of that theory? Oh wow. That's because a pretty, it's that's a pretty cool it, thing. it even says like gold enough to buy an army. It's like, well, they did buy an army. They they bought faceless men. <laughs> I like that theory. Yeah, it's a good. That's not mine. I, you know, some it's an old one from the forum. So the Targaryens on. destroyed Valyria. I mean, it. You know, it's always like at who benefits, right? Yeah, exactly. They definitely benefited more than anybody from the. I mean, from more than any single like family, they benefited the most from the destruction of Valyria. They became the last dragon. So of all the. Uh, of all the different Valerian technology, we've talked about fused stone, and we've uh, let's talk about Valerian steel real quick. Um, we talked about the dragons, but Valerian steel is interesting. Is a point I wanted to make, which is just the the formula for making it. Like we were saying, it probably involves blood magic. And if you look at the Lightbringer recipe, it's essentially blood magic. We we sacrifice Nissa Nissa, and it's her strength and blood and soul and spirit that goes into the sword. And makes it what it is. And so if if indeed the Valerian steel requires blood sacrifice to make, then it's essentially a, a copy of Lightbringer. You yeah. know, they're making magically magic swords. They don't catch on fire that we've seen. Uh, however, they are magical. Valerian steel doesn't break. You know, it's invincible. It's fantasy steel. So it's very like the Lightbringer uh, formula. And of, of course, all, all Valerian magic is rooted in fire and blood. And what is Lightbringer? It's a sword that was set on fire by blood. But really good parallels. Yeah. And if you think about it, like a lot of people think Jon Snow is Azor High. And let's just say that he is Azor High. He technically has Lightbringer because he has a Valyrian steel sword. And maybe those pale swords... Like Jamie has Jamie and Brienne when they're in Jamie's Weirwood dream, they have the pale swords, and we know that those 
pale swords that they have are ice that was redone by Taiwan. Well, if I, yeah, if I could break in real quickly, uh, it's kind of, yeah. I mean, in real life, uh, both Jamie and Brienne handle Oathkeeper, which is a black Valyrian steel, well, black and red Valyrian steel sword that used to be Ned Zeiss. And then in the dream, I've studied that one a lot. The line says, uh, the, the the swords took flame with the color of the steel, so it was silvery blue. So it implies that the swords they had, they don't. it doesn't look like Oathkeeper, but what you're saying is that symbolically, it essentially stands in for Oathkeeper because that's the sword they carried, right? Right. Right. Well, and, and I, since Oath- well, I'm, I'm, I'm like, my point is towards ice because of Ned's sword. And I'm thinking that even in the books, eventually Jamie will have Whittle's whale and Brienne will have old Oathke- Well, Brienne does have old keeper, but right, Jamie right, okay. will also have Whittle's whale. That would be cool. I mean, he has it on the show, so hopefully he yeah. has it in the books. Yeah, I would assume it's definitely within his reach. Um, although right now he's down in a cave with Brienne and Lady Stoneheart and Oathkeeper, and he's got to get out of that cave. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to get out. Stoneheart kills them both. He's, he's been in there for out. five years, man. <laughs> he's not going to be in Lady Stoneheart's cave. Kill him, Stoneheart. So to get back to get back to what you were hitting on, um, Gray, you don't even know like how much forum debate we've had over the color of the fire of these different swords, because the red sword is Lightbringer, quote unquote, and John's long claw, which is a black sword, a Valyrian steel sword, burns red in his fist in that dream where he's defending the wall. Yes. And and so but then we have swords of pale fire in the hands of the gemstone emperors. And in Jamie's dream, those swords are described as silvery blue flame and then also as pale flame. And that pale flame is, again, the exact same phrase as the Great Empire of the Dawn uh, sword. So, you know, the, and then like you mentioned also, the others have not flaming swords, but they're like shining swords. And they're called pale swords and they glow with moonlight and they're alive with moonlight, which is almost like Dawn's alive with light. And Dawn is a big white sword. So we've got this whole white sword, black sword dichotomy. Mm-hmm. And there's, the question is, the real question is, what's the dragon steel of the last hero? What is the sword that the last hero wielded? Was it a black sword like Valyrian steel or was it Dawn, a white sword? You know, and there's a lot of debate because even John's sword, Longclaw, it's black steel. But look at the pommel. The pommel is a white, uh, it's called a pale stone just like Dawn's made from a pale stone shaped into the wolf's head shape. So his sword is like a dichotomy. It's got a pale stone pommel like Dawn and then a black blade like Valyrian steel. So you could, I mean, it's go round and round with it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think that I don't think Jon Snow will have any sword, but Longclaw. Like, I don't think he'll ever get Dawn. I I just don't. And um, I don't want to say I just don't, but I feel like Dawn is more of a myth. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. If anything, Dawn wasn't, wasn't made from a fallen star. I don't think. If it was, like, I don't believe this. Like, so the legend of Dawn is that ancient house Dane ancestor tracked the falling star and made Dawn from a meteorite. Right. And it's pale as milk glass. So I don't see any way for John to get this sword. If that makes sense. Like, I don't see what, what, what is he going to travel? Like travel so to star. The- <laughs> okay. So here's how it happens. I have a, th- first of all, I want to say that I agree with you that I think, there's a good chance Dawn is just a legend. It's just in there to tell us maybe about the original uh, Lightbringer, but it doesn't have to be the new Lightbringer. Or maybe it's just in there for fable and example, and we're never going to see it. But if we see it, here's how it happens. Dark Star is on the loose. Dark Star sweats Azor- uh, Arthur Dane really hard and envies him. 
So Dark Star is going to steal Dawn, right? That's where it starts. Yeah, I could see him doing that. Mm -hmm. Then he gets appointed to Fagon's Kingsguard because Fagon is fake Rhaegar's son. And so Dark Star is going to be fake Arthur Dane, and he's going to have Dawn. <laughs> okay. So that that's kind of cool. That makes sense. Yeah, and it also I makes like sense it. politically, too, because of the alignments, Dorn and Fagon. So then after that, of course, Dark Star is a fuck nuts, and he's not the one destined to wield Dawn. So eventually somebody's going to kill Dark Star's ass, right? I think we can agree on that, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now, once Dark Star is dead, Dawn is floating free. And then it can make its way to John somehow. Like maybe Jamie will bring it to him or who knows. I mean, there's there's we got two books for it to travel. But the point is, we got to get it out of Starfall. And there's no Danes besides Edric Dane, who's too young, uh, who could be chosen as an official sword of the morning. The thing yeah. is that b because of Deanna Dane marrying Egg, who we were talking about earlier, Danny and John are both. Uh, you know, it's not how genetic works, but they're quote 25% Dane. How did I miss yeah. that? Okay, so this is really <laughs> great. So, um, Egg's, Egg's parents are Makar Targaryen, uh, who married, um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Makar Targaryen married Deanna Dane, and then they had Egg, and Egg married Black Betha Blackwood, right? So, we got Dane and Blackwood injected into this line, and then right oh. after that. His kids had incest for two generations leading up to Rhaegar and um, Dan uh, Danny and then John. So they all have Blackwood and Dane blood. John is Stark, Dane, Blackwood, and Targaryen? His Targaryen side has a bit of Blackwood and Dane. And his Stark side also has Blackwood, actually. He's got a Blackwood... Uh, Great grandmother and great great grandmother, I think is what it is. Oh yeah, that's a badass bloodline he has. So before we go back to Westeros, I want to talk about glass candles. Glass candles. First glass of all, candles. it's funny. It's funny how we're leaving Westeros and coming back from Westeros. The only way you can do that is we must be on a dragon. I mean, no, we have a glass candle. Oh, we have a glass candle. That's how we're traveling. Okay, so <laughs> so glass candles are really cool. And they're cool because, like you were saying, Gray, they're sort of parallel to the Weirwoods in that they enable, essentially, astral projection. Not only can we see things that are happening from afar, but we can actually enter people's dreams. And we see a very clear example of it in A Storm of Swords when Quave appears to Danny. A bath will help soothe me. She padded barefoot through her grass to her terrace pool. The water felt cool on her skin, raising goosebumps. Little fish nibbled at her arms and legs. She closed her eyes and floated. A soft rustle made her open them again. She sat up with a soft splash. Masande, she called. Eri, Jiqui. They sleep, came the answer. A woman stood under the persimmon tree, clad in a hooded robe that brushed the grass. Beneath the hood, her face seemed hard and shiny. She is wearing a mask, Danny knew. A wooden mask finished in burk red lacquer. Quaith, am I dreaming? She pinched her ear and winced at the pain. I dreamt of you on Beleriand when we first came to Astapor. You did not dream, then or now. What are you doing here? How did you get past my guards? I came another way. Your guards never saw me. If I call out, they will kill you. They will swear to you that I am not here. Are you here? No. Hear me, Daenerys Targaryen. The glass candles are burning. Here you go. This is glass candle astral projection. This is exactly what we hear about. We see it in action. And she also does it when Danny is on her ship. She appears to Danny. It's just not spelled out then. But basically, Danny wakes up and sees... Quave in the room talking to her. And then when she cries out and wakes up her bedmaids, Quave is not there. And here we find out exactly what it means. She says, No, the glass candles are burning. I am not here, but I am here. So the cool thing about astral projection is it's not exactly a dream. It's it's almost like a holographic projection. Like Quave is <laughs> sitting in some gloomy black stone building in a shy in front of a glass candle 
projecting her consciousness all the way to the top of this pyramid in Marine. That's what's going on right now. Like in 2018, she would be FaceTiming. <laughs> like that's basically. Or using uh, our Kylo, a Kylo phone. Yeah. Oh God. I get the sense that she's projecting this herself directly into Danny's mind, right? Basically. So that's why she says they will swear to you that I am not here because only Danny would be able to see her. Yeah. Right. So um, glass candles are made of obsidian or dragon glass. Mm -hmm. If uh, they're tall and twisted with sharp edges, and we know um, they give off unpleasantly bright light. Aside from that, the only light came from a tall black candle in the center of the room. The candle was unpleasantly bright. There was something queer about it. The flame did not flicker, even when Archmaester Marwyn closed the door so hard that papers blew off a nearby table. The light did something strange to colors, too. Whites were bright as fresh fallen snow. Yellow shone like gold. Reds turned to flame. But the shadows were so black they looked like holes in the world. Sam found himself staring. The candle itself was three feet tall and slender as a sword, ridged and twisted, glittering black. Is that... Obsidian, said the other man in the room, a pale, fleshy, pasty-faced young fellow with round shoulders, soft hands, close-set eyes, and food stains on his robes. Call it dragon glass, Archmaester Marwyn glanced at the candle for a moment. It burns, but is not consumed. What feeds the flame, asked Sam. What feeds a dragon's fire? Marwyn seated himself upon a stool. All Valerian sorcery was rooted in blood or fire. The sorcerers of the Freehold could see across mountains, seas, and deserts with one of these glass candles. They could enter a man's dreams and give him visions, and speak to one another half a world apart, seated before their candles. Do you think that might be useful, Slayer? We would have no more need of ravens. Only after battles. The Archmaester peeled a sour leaf off a bale, shoved it in his mouth, and began to chew it. Tell me all, your, tell me all you told our Dornish Sphinx. I know much and more of it, but some small parts may have escaped my notice. And then a second later, after Marwyn leaves the room, it says, Alaris smiled. I have a confession. Ours was no chance encounter, Sam. The mage sent me to snatch you up before you spoke to Theobald. He knew that you were coming. How? Alaris nodded at the glass candle. Sam stared at the strange pale flame for a moment, then blinked and looked away. Outside the window, it was growing dark. So you see very clearly, like, there's the basic rundown of what the candles can do. You can see across mountains and enter man's dreams. We know that we just saw that with Danny and Quaithe. Um, but the cool thing is, you know, how Marwin's been using it. He tells Sam, I know most of what you're going to tell me, but there might be like a couple small details that escaped my notice. So he's been watching everything. He knows about the Fist of the First Men. He knows about cold hands and probably knows about Bran. He knows damn near everything. And then the other part of it is like Alaris looking at the candle and saying flat out, that's how he knew you were coming. So he's been watching Sam like sail all across the sea and everything, all of yeah. it. So this is a powerful, powerful thing. Very. You've got to wonder, like the Valyrians had this, had dragon glass, right? So they they probably were concerned about other Valyrian dragon lords spying on them, right? So I kind of wonder, did they have some method of like blocking a dragon glass candle? Oh, because if if you're cons if, if if they fought like the World of Ice and Fire said, and they're squabbling amongst each other, I mean they don't want each other spying, right? So I figured they probably had some kind of way to block it. Maybe. That Seems would be like, cool. yeah. But I don't. Yeah, know. I'm sure. I'm sure that. Uh... You know, George always likes to show us only a fraction of what like a real mystery is. So I'm mm -hmm. sure that he would love to imply that the Valerians had all manner of other magics that we don't hear about. That's definitely a good guess. Mm -hmm. Out of everything the Targaryens left behind, the glass candles kind of baffle me. Like I can kind of see leaving Valerian steel. Okay, you already have Valerian steel. Okay, but gl a glass candle that works. Why would you leave something like that? Maybe or forget work. how to make it. 
Right, and and it's you know conceivable that uh, we'll eventually find out that they you know the Targaryens do have a couple glass candles because remember we've never gotten a POV from a Targaryen. We've only gotten the Maester's account of the official Targaryen history, and in the Princess and the Queen, it's still more Maesters summing things up, and then Dunk and Egg give us you know we see from Dunk's eye view Valerians, so it's well possible that they have dragon glass candles. But it's something they keep secret, and we just the maesters don't know. Hidden away at Dragonstone somewhere. I or think the maesters so. don't want to tell everyone. Maesters, shady, shady motherfuckers. <laughs> but so here's the reason why, Gray, why glass candles I think are important to the story. Is because if you're Marwyn the Mage, think about what we know about Marwyn. He is concerned with the end of the world. He's concerned with fighting the others. He wants to know all the information from Sam. Then he's going to go advise Daenerys. Like, the section we miss here is that he's saying, oh, you know, somebody should have gone to Daenerys already. He's he's concerned that Daenerys doesn't have the advice and knowledge that she needs. And she mm -hmm. clearly needs that help. So, basically, this, this story uh, leaves, this chapter leaves off with Marwyn saying he's hopping on a boat and hightailing it to the free cities to, uh, to go help Danny. And my whole, one of my big theories is that he brought a glass candle with him. I mean, why wouldn't you? It's like if you have this powerful, powerful tool and the Citadel doesn't really value them because they don't believe in magic and they're just locked up somewhere. And as you pointed out, he's the Archmaester of Magic. So the candles are in his control. Of course, he's going to bring one to Slaver's Bay. So yeah, there's no I, doubt that he took that with him. Right. It makes too much sense. I mean, it would be stupid for him not to. So. He's going to show up sometime in the next book in Slaver's Bay with a glass candle and he's going to train Danny how to use it. And Danny's it's like it's destined for her to use it. She's a Valerian. So I really I see Danny becoming like a real Valerian sorceress and using the glass candles. And I think that's how she'll go to a shy, quote unquote, and learn Quaid's truth. Like I get all I'm saying is get ready for Danny to like level up big time in the magic I, department. And I think the glass candle will be the focal point of that. I'd love to see that. George R. Martin has always said that he, he puts more and more magic every book that he releases. So it gets more and more magical every book. So it'll be the height of the magic will be in a dream of spring, supposedly. So yeah, it only makes sense. Yeah, it really does. It really does. I like that theory. I like it a lot. Right on. I would just love to see Daenerys just <laughs> Doing all kinds of like Melisandre type of shit, but actually being good at it. Valyrian like, sorceress. She actually has dragons, which we know dragons totally boost magic abilities. Yes. And, and she's kind of, I mean, it would be good for her plot arc too, because she was really stuck in Marine for a long time. She finally broke loose of that. But like her becoming more of a magician would really like just throw a wrench into everything we know about Danny. And yeah the catalyst for new growth and new new plot arc a little bit and would make her more terrifying when she comes to Westeros too. She'd be yeah. a messiah. I mean, she, she's magical, she's got dragons, she's freed all these slaves. You know. Uh, like, a lot of people don't like her now because they say she's too powerful. <laughs> wait until she's like <laughs> just, just this wait. fire yeah. sorcerer, Valyrian sorceress. <laughs> I can see it now. Yeah, right. one of my favorite scenes from the show uh, was Danny's uh, burning of all the cows inside that, uh, you know, I guess the building or whatever it was. Yeah. I, I thought that was righteous. Like, it wasn't out of the books, but it's very in keeping with the whole Targaryen vibe of, like, doing something kind of psychotic and severe and just burning a bunch of people. But it was kind of justified. Like, I thought that kicked ass. And when she walked out of that building... He's silhouetted against the fire. Like it's one of my favorite scenes in the show. Yeah, I really like that scene too. And I think in the house, I think that's gonna happen in the books, actually. Because I think she sees something like that in the at the house of the undying. Gray headed crones kneeling in front of her. Yes. So that's probably something they got from George. Well, we definitely it's foreshadowed that she'll sort of overthrow the Dothraki order in some way, but I think she's the stallion that mounts the world. Like, I think... Yeah, like her and Drogon together, right? Yeah, I mean, 
I, gu- I guess it would be the it would be them too. But like when they talk about these fires that she needs to the these fires that she needs to light, like fire for love, fire for whatever. Um, I don't think it it implies Drogon in those fires. Like I feel like things that Drogon burns isn't her burning things. The fire for life was to me her rebirth in the dragons. She actually set that funeral pyre. And if the show is true to books with that Dothraki burning all the calls, she actually set that that um pyre. But yeah, I do think um I feel like her and Drogon are are one. So yeah, I guess I would consider but I never thought about it like that. Like I always just thought it was just her that they were talking about in the when she got the prophecy after she ate the horse heart. It would fit her just as well as her child. I mean, the the one person that would unite the Kalasars, which she does at the end of season six. Well, at some part in season six, which is actually uh, prophesized in the House of the Undying. She sees the crones bowing before her beneath the Mother of Mountains. That scene. That's the scene that the scene from the show is based off of. Mm-hmm. So it right. seems like she is heading in the, in the direction of fulfilling that prophecy. It does. Yeah, that that's what I, and he was saying Daenerys and Drogon together. And I yeah, never but, I never thought about it like that. Well, because I, it was supposed to be her child and her child is Drogon. And uh, he's actually, you know, the dragons are compared to horses and she rides him like a stallion. So yeah. and he mounts the world because he flies. I uh, I hope to see the sword Blackfire turn up in uh, uh, Aegon's possession. You think the Golden Company uh, will give it to him? Yeah, I think they'll give it to him, and then we'll get Fagon with the sword Blackfire and uh, Dark Star with Dawn in the same uh, room. That'll be sick. Do That'll you think uh, Blood Raven has Dark Sister? Uh, do you think uh, he'll sure, give it? To- it's hidden think- beneath the root somewhere. Do you think he'll give, give it, it to, to someone? Give it to Mira. Ah, is she Jojen's dark sister? Uh, well, I don't know. She could be. <laughs> Blood Raven is Nisa Nisa, and Mira will kill her, kill him with dark sister. Yeah, I mean, I always want Valerian Steel Swords to turn up, and if it turns up somewhere, it seems like Blood Raven would have it. So, I, you know, originally, what's weird is I didn't think Bran was going to leave that cave originally in the books, but then when he left the cave in the show, I, I thought about it more. I was like, okay, I guess it makes sense. So I guess he's going to leave the cave in the books too. I don't know if he will or not. I'm so still not I, sold. Okay. I have a good question and that we can end this podcast on. Out of all of the Valerian steel that is that we know of, do you think we'll see any of it, any more of it in the books? Like Bright Roar, uh-huh. um, Red Rain, any of those, do you think? I think we potentially, yeah, why not? Well, so I think Blackfire will turn up. Like I was saying, I think the Golden Company will give Blackfire to Fagon. So that's that's going to be the big one for me is to see Blackfire. And better yet, if uh, Darkstar has Dawn and they end up in the same Kingsguard. <laughs> uh, let's see, who else? Which what are the swords Does Euron have a Valyrian steel sword? Did I don't think he has one, no, but I think, I think he one might. Of his people, one of his people has Red Rain. Mm-hmm. And I think another Greyjoy person has nightfall yes nightfall too yeah i mean if euron has valyrian still armor and he's saying that he got it from valyria i mean he might have found a sword too so i'm just saying like it'd be it'd be like i'd die of laughter if he pulls out bright roar i was like... just thinking that <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun what if he present like what if this cersei euron stuff goes down like it's going down in the show like they become a thing i actually do think they will become allies in the books seems like it but um, what if he presents her with Bright Roar? <laughs> it would be like a, if, if he gave it to her, that would kind of solidify. You know, I have a, journeyed to the depths of doomed Valeria to bring you this family sword of House Lannister. Yeah. yeah, Cersei's such a bitch. I hope she's just not like, we already have two Valerian swords. And then she just turns away. Yeah, get this oh. shit out of here. You start <laughs> Followed with. by, what was that line Euron gave to Jamie about, you know, one in the one in the stink or whatever like what was it a finger yeah. in the bum oh, yeah <laughs> jesus can we not what is with those people and fingers in the ass <laughs> fucking oh, game like, of thrones writers i whatever. thought that was pretty funny <laughs> that, that was funny 
God. He's a charismatic uh, character. You're on. Uh, I kind of like him because of the magic and stuff that. In the book, yeah, I, I adore the character. As far as that that show, you're I you know I hate it, but whatever. This <laughs> I know. I try not to talk to you too much about the show because <laughs> you're just like I'm like oh let's talk about dragons and you're let's talk about season seven. You're just like why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just got it on Blu-ray actually, so that's super interesting. Uh, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe we could even see some Valerian steel in the show, some new steel. Like I, I really, really thought that Blood Raven in the show or the Three Eyed Raven in the show would give Dark Sister to Bran or Mira. It's no. like this Valerian steel sword that he was last in possession of is just look like fuck it. No one watched. It it. You can go ahead. I was just gonna say it could happen in the books. Yeah, but I'm saying no one that watches the show other than like people like us have any idea what the fuck Dark Sister is. They don't know. They don't, they're like, what's Dark Sister? They don't know. <laughs> they don't know and they don't care. So that's why it's just like, little things like that. But he could have said, like, like he could have said, like a little thing, like this was my family's sword, and I want you to give it to someone. I don't know. He could have said anything. I don't know. But then, but I kind of feel like, okay, so. Maybe in the books, he is going to get Dark Sister. And in the books, he may give it to his Dark Sister, which is Arya. But in the show, they do this cat's paw thing. Like, is that going to happen in the books? I don't know. Yeah, that, I like that idea that the cat's paw thing that in the show parallels Arya getting Dark Sister. That would that would be sick. I'd, I mean, that'd be kind of fan servicey. But George Martin always has a cool way of making things happen in a believable way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if it would... I don't think it would be fancy. It might be because I'm really happy thinking that that could happen. And I'm a fan. You know, and I'm so I, <laughs> I was watching Game of Thrones with someone for the first time. And it's what season is that? Season four where Blood Raven, where it's they take the scene directly from the book where Blood Raven says to Bran, You will never walk again, but you will fly. And the person that I was watching, watching it with goes, Oh, that's so lame. I totally guessed that. And I'm just thinking, Fuck you in the fucking face because I'm just mm-hmm. like that's one of those things that like you you're like you're set up to guess right like mm-hmm. it's it, it, like it's one thing if if a plot's predictable you can guess everything but it's another thing if the if they're leaving clues in place that are set up so that you can guess it not everything is meant to be not predicted and I, I think George does a good job um a lot of people don't they take that you will fly as Bran is going to warg a dragon or fly a dragon or he's one of the three heads of the dragon. People a lot of people don't relate it to a raven. I think I think it's pretty clearly ravens. I don't know if Bran's going to warg a dragon but I I I'm I think it's ravens. I, I think do. it I think it was ravens he was talking about too. I think I think Bran warging a dragon is at least possible. I won't say yeah. it's likely. But it's possible. Yeah, it's I, definitely, definitely. I look. Possible. I look at a dragon. I mean, there a raven is one thing. Like a, a like a wolf is one thing. But a dragon, this is this is a different kind of creature. This is like a, a more creature. complex. It would be more complex. Yeah, to, these, these are magical beings. It's not just not not like anything. But you know, I think it would be on the scale of warging a human, or maybe even harder. Because I mean, dragons just harder. being dragons are intrinsically magical. Yeah, yeah. It could be that uh, since dragons are fire made flesh, skin changing a dragon would almost like burn your mind. Mm-hmm. Oh, that that oh that's so, that's uh, incredible. Like you try to work and it's like oh, ah, it's it's fucking fire comes latched, out. It quins latched on to it. Yeah. No, I think the best, uh, perhaps maybe a best a skin changer can do is sacrifice themselves to sort of drive a dragon mad, uh, and maybe maybe make it crash. You know. Hmm. Oh, because I like there's, that. Because there's definitely the it's several times speculated in the world of ice and fire. Like, why didn't the Valerians come further? Jamie wonders about it too. Like, why didn't they come? Why did they just make Dragonstone and stop? That Westeros had so much gold and wealth, and they they could have come and taken it, but they didn't. And a lot of people speculate it's because the children of the forest could fuck with their ability to control the dragons, and so they they feared that and never came there. I like that. That's uh, 
that's logical because you you don't know what well why didn't they come sooner but i I do remember they thought that they prophesied the doom of man would come from that continent well the gold of house lannister in particular and that that's the other piece of the theory that uh that that the money that paid for bright war bought faceless men that caused the doom well we've talked about We've we've been through about what ten thousand years of history. Jesus Christ, <laughs> ten thousand years of Valyrian history. I appreciate you guys for coming on. It's been a lot of fun. Do you want to let everybody know where they can find you at? I am Ideas of Ice and Fire. You can find me on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Patreon. Yeah, I do theories on a song of Ice and Fire, and I do Dune. I have the best Dune videos on the internet. I'm not even gonna be humble. Like, oh, because, yeah, so you can check those out. So thanks. Thanks every, thanks for having me on. Thanks, uh, Gray and LML. It's been great. I vouch for Quinn's Dune videos and Quinn's yeah. videos in general. Yeah, yeah. me too. And uh, I'm LML, and I hope you've uh, enjoyed me on the show today. Try not to uh, interrupt so much. And Oh, my nice God. So. Dude, I feel bad. Dude, like a bunch of people, not a bunch, but like three or four people commented. And I listened back to it. I totally did interrupt too much. Those people were right. And I, you know, I we were having we were having up, a LML. debate. We were no, having dude, a debate. Dude, Tony got me riled up and I hadn't eaten and I had a hard day. <laughs> I said you were hungry. I said yeah, hungry. I was I was hangry. But I didn't feel like that. I didn't feel well, like it that. doesn't, but it doesn't make for good listening when there's too much of it. And I listened back. I didn't like it. So in any case, I really appreciate you having me back on. And I hope everybody that listened enjoyed what we talked about today it was a lot of fun and you can find uh, more of my stuff at luciferMeansLightbringer.com. and i got all kinds of podcasts about some of the stuff i've been talking about and you know gray likes it so it's at least half decent right mm-hmm. <laughs> no i vouch for both of their work they are two of the best in the community and they've always been really nice to me and i like to do these podcasts just so i can hear them talk about the shit i don't know (laughs) but um i want to thank you guys again for coming thanks everyone that's listening thanks to everyone that supports me on patreon as always if you like this video please give it a thumbs up please click that subscribe button hit that notification bell and join the sweet summer family